Uh, this is our second episode of a yet to be titled discussion. Something discussion. Long form discussion. Yeah. Movies, media. A flood of content. Yeah. A flood of content. That's right. Today I thought I'd talk about a few movies I saw over cool. the past week. Cool. One of which you lent me to watch on Blu-ray. I'm assuming you have movies to talk about as well. Of course. Yes. Yeah, okay. Of course. <laughs> Before we jump into it, um, just as like, like a just as a thank you, I brought to you some albums. To albums, borrow. yes. Vinyl, not vinyl. Some plastic compact discs. Compact discs. Yes. What are those? It's the future, man. It's the future of music. It's the future. It is. It's hi-fi. Always looking forward to the future. Hi-fi. Stereo. Stereo. So these three albums, um, I'm sure at least one of them you've heard of before. Just an old bag you've got here, like Maybe. a shower shower bag or something. <laughs> yeah, it's is, my, that, is that waterproof? My super stretchy echo bag. Cool. It can like fit it. like anything in it. Does look echo, yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> first album I brought, you're probably, actually I'll save that for last. Let's do, okay, this one. I mentioned this a few times to you. I don't think you've ever listened to it before. This is Loveless. By My Bloody Valentine. I've heard some of their music, but I've never heard this CD. Okay, this one. Yeah. <laughs> I first heard this in when I was in high school, and it just like completely blew my mind. I want to say it's like unlike anything you've heard before, but mm. at this point, I'm sure lots of other bands have like copied their sound. Right. So I'm sure they've imitated them yeah. since then. Right. Now it's hard to say. It's uh, like a shoegaze classic it's very like pure like wall of sound mm. psychedelic like mm. noise like if you'd like to listen to albums to just like break them down sonically this is like the perfect album for that cool yes yeah. i'd recommend listening to this like in bed like in the dark <laughs> <laughs> oh i used to listen to a lot of music yeah back in the day I have two very vivid memories from like that era, like in high school. One of which was listening to the downward spiral in the dark. I used to do that too. In bed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that blew my mind. Yeah. Second one was this album. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's in good so, company. So, yeah. It's fantastic. I really recommend it. Please check it out. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'll check yeah. it out. All right. Yeah, albums I used to listen to the dark would be Ones like that, Down Spiral. Yeah. Old Tool albums. Like Tool is a good one, yeah. Anima. Yeah. yeah. I, I've been doing that recently, listening to Tool in the Dark. Yeah. Yeah. Really, you really have a different experience when you listen to them like that. That's sure. right. A scarier experience, I would say. Especially the older albums. Scarier, uh, more personal. Yeah. Just kind of takes on a different life. It does. Yeah. yeah. Second album for today is an album called Introducing. Introducing. Introducing, like, so. not E-N, not I-N-T-R, <clears throat> oh, it's E-N-D-R-O. I was gonna say, like, someone who can't spell. So. Yeah, yeah, here it is, Introducing. <laughs> yeah. Introducing. Yes, by uh, DJ Shadow. Okay, I know DJ Shadow. Okay. Yeah. Have you heard this album before? Maybe. Yeah, the name is familiar. Yeah. I think I have heard this one. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic album. It is, if not 100% mm. samples, it's very close to 100%. Like, he just created this entire album from, like, found samples from mm. other music albums, uh, movies, like, interviews like documentary type things just like mashed it all together mm. like cut it up it's fantastic it's a uh, good one i guess you would call this like instrumental hip-hop though like when listening to it it can be pretty like lively like sonically mm -hmm. but at the same time because it's all like sampled mm. sounds sampled beats it kind of has like a like weird like liminal space feeling like uncanny valley it kind of feels like being at like a club 
when no one else is there. <laughs> Does that make sense? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great album. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Totally okay. recommend it. This one I think is great for listening to when like taking a walk or commuting or studying, something like that. This next album, I'm sure you've heard before. Um, I don't think it really matters how you listen to it because it's going to sound like hell on earth anyway. <laughs> that is a Skinny Puppy, Too Dark Bark. <laughs> uh, I know you're a Skinny Puppy fan. I am, yeah. yeah. Have you heard this album before? I think I have, yeah. But I've, I'm more a fan of other ones by them. Yeah. yeah. I would say their music... You can kind of divide it into like two eras, hmm. like the like 1980s, like very like hardcore yeah. industrial era, yeah. and then their like 2000s, more not techno, but hmm. you know, it's more dancey, right? Yeah. yeah, more produced, I guess. More probably. produced, right? Yeah, I would consider this album their like most accessible album from their like 1980s hardcore industrial period it came out in 1990 it's it's quite the listen <laughs> <laughs> it's about everything you could ever ask for <laughs> very nice back design yes. as well yeah. <laughs> well thanks man no yeah. problem so I lent you Dr. Sleep the uh, follow up to The Shining the sequel to The Shining yes yes yep and I watched it. I watched the director's cut version. I recommend it. The director's yep. cut. Yep. Really good movie. I remember when it came out, and I remember it being on Netflix, like around 2019, yep. 2020. Mm-hmm. And I never got around to watching it then. Like, part of me was interested in watching it, but I just never got around to it. And then the other part of me was like, do I really want to see it? Is it going to live up to The Shining? You know? Like, I've seen a lot of, like, sequels to, like, great movies that mm, just, like, yeah. fall on their face, you know? So I was hesitant for a while. And after talking to you about it, you told me it's it's a great movie. So, you know, I checked it out. It's good. It's good. It's very good. I think I had confidence in it because of who directed it. So it's directed by Mike Flanagan, who has already done other Stephen King adaptations. He adapted Gerald's Game. Yeah. You know that book? And yeah. uh, he's done like Haunting of Hill House, like classic stuff. Mm-hmm. Pretty much everything that he's done has been very well made. Uh, he's obviously very into his craft, like he's a very professional director who's obviously very knowledgeable about Stephen King I guess the challenge he had with Dr. Sleep is he had to kind of please Stephen King fans and Stanley Kubrick fans and they famously Mm. Stephen King famously hates The Shining (laughs) (laughs) yeah I've heard that before Um, because you know Stanley Kubrick took a lot of stuff that Stephen King cares about in the book out like the hedge monsters. And the I heard he like changed the color of the um, family car, like out of spite or something really? like that. Yeah. Well, he changed the room number as well, so it's really? it's not two three seven in the in the book. It's a different number. Really? So, so basically, Mike Flanagan wanted to get approval from Stephen King before he made Doctor Sleep. Obviously, there was a movie to be made because Stephen King made Stephen King wrote a sequel to the movie. That's another thing. Like, Sorry. it wasn't until after I watched the movie <clears throat> that I learned that the novel Doctor Sleep was published like pretty recently. Yeah, not long ago, like yeah. 2017 or something like that. Yeah, it's not much older than the movie. Yeah. yeah. So they did like kind of get the movie done quite quickly yeah. afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so. He went to Stephen King and he told him the idea that he was going to keep the Overlook Hotel. The Overlook Hotel burns down in the original novel, so it would not exist in the Doctor Sleep world. Hmm. Um, but you know, if you've seen the movie, 
spoiler, the Overlook burns down at the end of the movie instead of the original Shining so story. It still happens, just kind of yeah. later in a different, yeah. right. different time. So, you know, it's kind of pleasing everyone and Stephen King gets to watch it burn, right? Yep. The hotel he hates. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like, I think he did a really good job of, like, pleasing fans of the book and the movie. You know? And I'm a fan of both. I prefer the Kubrick movie to the King book. Like, I don't think things in the book would work in a movie like the hench monsters and like you couldn't have done that at that time with those special mm. effects and everything and even now they might look quite silly right with like cg or something right so, i think a movie like that could very well do without like right. cg yeah yeah but you know he did like change some of the characters as well like the way they are in the book is kind of different to the movie but you know i think two things can be great it can be a great novel and a great movie right and yep. um, you know they both exist because of the book and Stephen King's experience with maybe seeing ghosts and certainly alcoholism <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think he did a good job of like balancing the two like the original material and the yeah the so Stanley Kubrick mm, vibe for my opinion um, coming from someone who has only seen the movies I've never read the novels before okay <laughs> I thought the like new material, like the new direction of the story for Doctor Sleep, you know, taking place like you know decades later, was very interesting, and I also enjoyed like whenever they had like flashbacks mm. or callbacks to the original movie, mm. it felt very authentic. Yeah, right. Yeah, it felt like it could have been Kubrick. You know, making it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it felt old and new at the same time. Mm. Yeah, like kind of shuffled t- together. Mm. I think a lot of that is to do with how good the performances are too, right? There's some very good performances. Yeah, in the movie. Yeah, like the actress who plays uh, his wife, Torrance. Torrance's wife, his mother, and he Torrance's mum. She like gets all the mannerisms correct, like even. Halloran, the chef. Yeah, really yeah. Get the I made a mental note of that. Like expressions, her yeah. mannerisms are spot on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> What's her name? Like Sh- Shelley Duvall. Shelley Duvall is the original actress. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The new actress really does like really get yeah. her mannerisms. It kind of feels like they hired like a professional Shelley Duvall impersonator <laughs> for that role. But that really helps, like you believe. Yeah. That it's from a continuation of the original movie. Yeah. And then uh, Little Danny is very believable too. Right, yeah. Spoiler alert, maybe. Later on in the movie, where um, Danny's in the Overlook Hotel, he sits down at the bar, and the bartender comes. Now, my first thought was, okay, this guy is supposed to be like a Jack Nicholson lookalike. But... Is it really supposed to be him, or is it just supposed to be That's like a good point? Yeah, like an idea or like a ghost to, you know, mimic him. Well, supposedly he's now when he dies at the in at the end of the original movie, he obviously becomes part of the hotel, right? Like, right. You know, Grady is always gonna be there, mm. and Grady says to him in the original movie, like you've always been here, so he's like part mm. of the hotel. It's kind of like you're absorbed by the hotel, right? Yeah. So it may not look exactly like him because it's like the hotel's version of him, I guess, in a way. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Like, it looks like a cheap copy yeah. of him. But was it on purpose or right. because that's the best they could do? And I yeah. think it was on purpose. It could be either. Maybe the actor like overdoes it a little. But like to get... Like Jack Torrance, like Jack Nicholson's performance is so crazy, original maybe, like to <laughs> to get that yeah. exactly right without being like a parody would be quite difficult, right? Mm. You know, that is very true. So yeah. people do Trump, that could easily Trump. go into a parody territory. So people do Trump impersonations or something. Yeah. Like, like how do you get someone who's crazy as that in terms of their personality and make it seem genuine? Do you know that actor by the way who plays? 
uh, Jack Torrance. I ghost. don't, but I thought he looked a little familiar. He's the kid from E.T. What the heck? <laughs> what the heck? Really? Yeah. He's uh, often used by Mike Flanagan. He's in other stuff that he's made, too. That's insane. E.T. boy. <laughs> so he does have acting chops. He's a, he's a good actor. Yeah, I, I thought that scene maybe overdid it a little bit. But, and also a little bit like the like the twins come back, right? Like all the ghosts appear at the end. It's a little cartoonish, if I had a criticism of that scene. Speaking of cartoonish, um, again, this is just my opinion. And I don't know if this is a critique of the novel or the movie. Hmm. Or both. But the like main... Like antagonists in the movie, like that group of Oh, the True Knot? Yeah. Like the vampires kind of Yeah. People who like absorb the shining. Yeah. Like their whole thing, like the whole concept of them felt very I don't know, like like from a children's movie almost. Maybe, yeah. But like like, like in a more mature take on like, like a children's movie like plot. A, like a dark fantasy maybe. Yeah. 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 Like the witches or something that like rolled down something like that yeah, yeah 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 interestingly like you know Stephen King's uh, son is also an author right Jerry yeah. Hill they've co-written together right at that time they were both writing when Stephen King was writing Doctor Sleep he was writing another book and coincidentally they both like created almost exactly the same antagonist <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the king I think he's like hey dad what are you writing oh these vampires who drinks shining they're my fucking characters either, so. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently I haven't read Joe Hill's book um, but the true knot appear in his book like Stephen King said you can put them in your book so they kind of cross worlds yeah. uh. they are like kind of like a children's book char- kind of characters but they're also like very disturbing in a lot of ways like how they prey on children and the book like really shows you the the violence to children, right? Like from the very beginning of the movie. Yeah, there's a scene in the movie of them going yeah. after the, the baseball yeah. boy. Right, the baseball boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they don't really show much, but you know, it's yeah. it's implied. They show enough, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, without being it, without being, I guess you could say it could be exploitative if they showed you any more. Right. But, uh, in the book, he doesn't hold back on the descriptions. It's like fully intense, like yeah, how I'm they sure. kill the boy. So, yeah. but then Stephen King's books do have, often do have, violence to children. Like if you know Pet Cemetery, yep, that story. The book is like very intense when it comes to describing dead kids. So, it's a very easy way to get under people. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's more shocking that. You don't really see much violence to kids in modern movies like you did 30, 40 years ago. It was a bit more common than it is now. So when you see it in like um, like a big budget movie, it's quite effective. Right? Yep. And also there's a scene in the movie, right at the beginning of the movie, where he steals money from a woman he sleeps with, Danny Sorens. He goes on like a bender, he gets into a fight, and he wakes up and he's next to this like woman. And That's a very surprising scene for me, seeing where yeah. that character ended up in adulthood. <laughs> I would have never imagined, but it makes sense. Like it makes sense yeah. when you have a fucked up childhood. You yeah, know, you often end up pretty fucked up. <laughs> well, also like just like mimicking your dad in a way, right? right? Yeah. Like, so yeah, he just as much as he 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 hates his dad, but he also like he says, "I miss my dad" as well in the movie, right? near the end he says I have sympathy for my dad in a lot of ways so Mm -hmm. um, you know in the original Shining Jack Torrance is like a really wannabe novelist but alcoholism kind of destroys his dreams Mm -hmm. maybe he had a family when he didn't want to have them so I think he has a lot of sympathy for his dad and that kind of like fucks him up a little bit in one scene in the movie he says how how he, he connects to his father by drinking. Like he gets to, he gets to know his father mm. when he drinks. Yeah. You can quite imagine what it was like yeah. for his dad in a way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, Stephen King has a lot of history of alcoholism and drug addiction, so 
you'll find a lot of his characters are like addicts in some ways. You know? Yeah. Even the true not are addicts, right? Mm. Addicted to steam shining, which is like a drug to them. So like addiction is in like almost all the characters. But overall, yeah. Yeah, great movie overall. Yeah. I thought the the performances were very good. Um, what is the name of the the girl that plays the like main shining sucker lady? Oh, Rebecca Ferguson. Rebecca yeah. Ferguson. Okay. Yep. She's very good. I thought her performance was a little, a little, like over the top or campy. Forced. Okay. Yeah. I guess that character is. Again, it way. seemed like a an appropriate performance for like a. Like children's movie, mm. like I was saying. Mm. Mm. I guess maybe if you like do read the book, that character is very kind of flamboyant and. Okay. Again, I haven't read the book. Forced, so. but I thought she was pretty good. She's kind of scary as well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they all are like the whole group are scary. So I kind of like the scene where they go to the World Trade Center. Is that in the movie or is that in the book? I can't remember. The World Trade Center. They go to uh, New York when 9-11 happens to absorb all the steam. Oh, that's in the book, for sure. That's not in the movie. That's not in the movie? (laughs) Unless we saw different movies. I I just dreamed about that after reading the book. No, this is a scene in the book. So in the book, they go to the World Trade Center because they know 9-11 is going to happen. And all the steam is coming off New York. So they absorb all the steam from 9-11. I can see why that wasn't added. <laughs> <laughs> I think in a book... I think it's such a strong image. I just saw it in my mind, I guess. And I thought I, it was in the movie. I think in a book form, it's safe. But as soon as you put it on screen, <laughs> you're going to have the you're gonna have the commenters <laughs> uh, see it. And it's like, they're going to have a field day with that. <laughs> it's alluded to in the, in the book that they go to, like, like World War II places where a lot of people die and yeah yeah they, they kind of hinted that they've been alive for like thousands of years yeah. yeah a long time yeah so yeah in the book they go to like places of huge death and absorb all this yeah. but they like suggest that it's like it's not so much that they get from it they get like a lot of it from kids with the shining but every human has like a little bit in them so if like 3,000 people die in like 10 minutes, it's like one kid with a shiny. Mm. But then like one kid keeps them going for a long time, right? They just like store it all in these capsule things. It's a crazy idea. Yeah. The the young girl in the movie. What's her name? Do you remember? Abra? Abra, Abra yeah, Abra, yeah. I thought they did a really good job like portraying her power, like her abilities. Mm. Like, oh, like how she like jumps like out of her body and like twists yeah, the world up. Like how down. she kept yeah. like catching like all the like like the mad people yeah. off guard. Yeah, she like lays traps for them and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Mental traps. Yeah. Puzzles. Yeah. Like as a way of visualizing that, I mean that's quite a hard thing to visualize, so yeah, they did a good job of that, I think. Yeah. It was like a like a psychic home alone. Kind of <laughs> like a scene from Dragon Ball Z or something. You know. More adult, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah. Would you be interested in like watching like other Mike Flanagan movies that he's made? Interesting you said that. Um, a good segue. The second movie I watched this past week was Hush. Hush, okay, I've seen that. Yeah. Good. That was the uh, Netflix exclusive movie? I, think I don't think that. it's Netflix exclusive, but oh. I watched it on Netflix. Okay. I didn't realize it was directed by Mike Flanagan until afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a nice coincidence. For um, me, that's probably his weakest movie. Really? Yes. Yeah. It seemed like a like a typical like home invasion slasher movie mm. with just a small like gimmick attached. It was good fun. It was a nice it's like, fun. Yeah. popcorn flick. And it's like pretty well made, right? Like it's very competently made. So. Yeah, it has good reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, which is why I checked it out. Yeah. So the premise is, there's a uh, a woman living alone in like a like a cabin in the woods. She's a professional author, and when she was 
13 or when she was a teenager she got an illness where she lost her hearing and her voice so she's like a like a deaf mute like that kind of situation mm -hmm. and like one day like a serial killer comes to her house at night and then does the typical like slasher movie villain stuff like cutting off the power tormenting her mm. where she's in a disadvantage because she can't hear anything she can't call for help what surprised me with the movie is like in the promotional images and like the trailer the villain in the movie like he's masked right mm. but in the movie he unmasks himself very quickly that's just like a very plain like white mask right like a, yeah like an even more plain michael myers mask yeah like, it's like, a very like milk toast mask <laughs> and when he removes the mask which is like probably 30 minutes in his face is even more milk toast than the mask is <laughs> it doesn't look menacing at all the most menacing menacing thing about him is like a neck tattoo but i mean who cares <laughs> you know i think it would have been more effective if the character had less lines in the movie. I can't remember why he takes his mask off. Just he's like, like he doesn't care that she sees his face. Or... I think she she like wrote it on the window, like take your mask off. Oh, so she's like daring him to so, something like that. It. Okay, yeah. Right. And then he does, and it's okay. like, okay, what was the point? Maybe he's like, I'm gonna kill you anyway. So yeah, goes, yeah. But like, that's it, confidence in his yeah ability. I guess yeah. yeah. I just think it would have been a more disturbing movie if he was more of the, like a silent type more like Michael Myers yeah it's like, like a machine yeah or more like uh, like the killer from Scream mm. for example I guess it's like he's trying to do something different yeah from the character so I can understand that yeah yeah and uh, in such like a basic setup it's kind of difficult to do anything that innovative with that character yeah it's like there's a scene in the movie where after being unmasked, he comes across like the husband of one of the woman's friends, and they're just like talking, like in the yard. Mm. And of course, the like the husband's character has no idea like who he is. You know, he's like dressed normally. He has no mask on. Mm. It's just like I can see what they're going for, but it just wasn't really creepy. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Well, the point is that it's got to be creepy, right? So if it yeah. doesn't do that, it's kind of a failure. Yeah. 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 Overall, I enjoyed the movie. Mm. But probably my main issue was just with the, with the killer in the movie. The, yeah. The reason I don't remember it so well is exactly what you're describing. I just kind of, kind of forgot about it after I watched yeah. it. It's just like one of those... Like a midweek, found it on Netflix kind of movies. Exactly, yeah. It's slightly better than that, but <laughs> not by much, right, I would say. Like, you can still feel like it's made by a, a good director, like they know what they're doing. But yeah. it, I don't think that movie had any of Mike Flanagan's flair or, like, things he really cares about in that movie. I do think it's like that was like a paid-for-hire gig that he did. I could be wrong. For Netflix. Uh, like not a passion project? But no, more of a... no, no. Like just a, a payday mm. project for Netflix. But he's not that kind of director. Like he does do stuff that he wants to do. Um, but of all of his movies, that one is the least him, I would say. I think I've seen like all of his movies at this point. I um, noticed he's also behind um, In Night Mass. Midnight Mass is his real passion project. Yeah, so, and you've been recommending that to me yeah. for a while now. Like he wanted to make that before all of his movies. Like he's yeah. been planning that I think since like college or high school. Yeah, so, um, and I think he's like made all of these movies so he could get the funding to make that. <laughs> he has long-term goals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really like Midnight Mass. is very good. I thought the last episode wasn't as good as what came before it there's one absolutely fantastic episode about halfway through it is it over it's over it's just a, a limited series okay. there's no not going to be a season two or anything it's just one hmm. series um 
but yeah that's really well made you can tell it's really a passion project some very good performances in that uh, yeah his other stuff like the first thing I saw him uh, make was uh, Oculus Oculus oh okay uh, yeah Eamon Mirror mm. I saw that mm. on his Wikipedia um I think he's got a thing about like people having like shiny eyes. Like his first three movies, everyone has like these shiny, <laughs> scary eyes. <laughs> That's a good movie. That's very creepy. Um, he made Gerald's Game. I mentioned, which is a I've Stephen been King. To watch that, yeah. That's a Netflix Stephen King uh, adaptation, and he made the sequel to Ouija, the Ouija board. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe franchise. Did you see that one? I saw it. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, he's. Yeah, I never it's... saw the first one. It seemed kind of gimmicky. It's very surprising that he took like a sequel, and it's really his style. You can tell he made it. He's got shiny eyes. Nice. <laughs> That's a creepy movie. Yeah, I recommend that. Um, I think obviously Doctor Sleep is his best movie that he's made. I'd imagine his most well known. <clears throat> probably, yeah. And I'd probably go Gerald's Game as the second best movie he's made. Definitely, he's going to make some really good stuff in the future, I would think. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, a decent version of Ed Cemetery. The last one. So. I've, been, I've only seen the one from the 80s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, Have you seen number two with Edward Furlow? <laughs> I saw the first one on VHS from Blockbuster Video. Like when I was a kid. It has a lot of fans. It has a lot of people who like that movie. Um, for me, I just found like all of the really horrible, creepy stuff from the book, especially like him digging up his dead son, which is a really disturbing part of the book, is taken out of the movie. And in the new one, you know there's a new version, right? Yeah, out. yeah. Yeah. Um... That one like completely changes like the story of the book in a lot of ways. Mm. So that book seems doomed never to get a really good adaptation. Yeah. Some books have that problem. <laughs> they do. Yeah. Um, it's probably the scariest book I've ever read. So it'd be cool to get like a really scary movie version. So what I've been watching. Yeah. What have you watched? So recently I've been on a bit of a giallo Italian horror. Spree, I guess. Recently I watched six Giallo movies in a couple of weeks. So I watched Black Sabbath, not the band. It's a movie. Oh, we talked about this recently. <laughs> the, the band was named after the movie? Maybe? I don't know. And they came out, came out around the same time? I think so. So Black Sabbath was made in 1963, the movie. Uh, I also watched some Argento, it's Giallo, so I watched Inferno, Opera, Tenebre, and Deep Red. Spread. Deep Red, or Profondo Rosso, as it's called in Italian. Profound Red. Bravo. <laughs> Bellissimo. <laughs> Bono. And I watched Bay of Blood as well. Damn. Yeah, so Bay of Blood and Black Sabbath were both directed by Mario Bava, uh, both of which I really enjoyed. And the Argento ones, probably the best one I watched was Tenebre. Uh, Tenebre is about like a horror novelist living in. He goes to Italy, I think, for like promotion of his book, or something like that. And a killer just starts often people that are connected to him. Kind of a very good like who done it story. Which a lot of Dario Gento's movies are it, like he keeps you guessing to the end who is the killer. They all have this kind of trope where you never see the killer, you just see like his hands, his feet. He's always wearing black, like fashionable. That's kind of something to do with giallos. Everyone's always like high fashion <laughs> Italian. Right. <laughs> Lots of like orange blood, <laughs> black <laughs> gloves, <laughs> leather gloves. Yeah. Right. Do you know about James Wan's new movie, Malignant? James Wan, the Saw director, made the Fast and Furious like, submarine 
movie. Did he do like The Conjuring? And... Yeah, right. Yeah, Conjuring, Insidious, Insidious. like those kind of movies. Yeah, no. yeah. Uh, he's he did the Saw series. Okay. Um, his new movie is called Malignant. It's pretty wild. Oh movie. yeah, I've seen that around the trailer for it. Yeah. yeah, like the poster or like the cover is like red. <laughs> the woman's like red face. Yeah, and, like, her eye looking up like that. Yeah. yeah. So I've seen that movie and. The killer is very Argento inspired. The killer wears like all black and he has like this gold dagger and mm -hmm. black leather gloves. So oh, like, cool. lots of Argento influence going on in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the one I wanted to talk about is the most recent one. So I watched uh, Profondo Rosso Deep Red. If you were to give like a like one page like cheat sheet explanation of Italian horror like how would you describe it? Um, like, what makes it unique? I guess they always have a lot of violence towards women, right? Exploitation, <laughs> violence towards women. <laughs> Almost all of them have that. Like, women seem to suffer in every single one that I see. They're always killed in, like, in, in like brutal ways. They're, like, tormented. Uh, fashion I mentioned as a part of it like everyone seems like fashionable or intellectual in some way just from what I've seen like uh, vivid vivid yeah very colorful like bright colors right bright yeah. reds pinks yeah yeah Suspiria I guess yeah would, is the most obvious example of that maybe yeah another one I watched recently Inferno which is another Dario Argento movie that probably is like closest to Sus Suspiria there's like pinks and greens and there's actually a voiceover that says the key's in the cellar don't go to the cellar <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them have quite like wooden acting as well like a lot of the acting is a bit off in some of the uh, giallo movies it kind of adds to the, I'm going to say it adds to the Fwinky, but what would you say? <laughs> the mood? Yeah, the mood. There you go, mood. The <laughs> mood. Yeah. Adds to the mood. Mm. It, it sets a certain mood. Yeah. With like stiff or like awkward acting. I've always been a bit iffy about like Jello horror. Like some people are really into it, right? They have, it really has its like hardcore fans who like just binge Jello. They love Jello horror. For me, I'm kind of like a bit here and there with it. Like, I really love Suspiria. Um, I have a great, had a great experience watching Suspiria when I lived in England. The oldest, I think it's the oldest operating theatre still open. And every Friday night they would show classic movies. So I went one night, walked across town. A little dangerous. <laughs> Sat in this big, like, Victorian-style auditorium. And they played Suspiria, like, super loud. So you really got the full impact of it. So, yeah. you know, I had a really great experience. And I haven't had an experience as good as that with Giallo horror since then. But in the last few years, I started watching Lucio Fulci's movies. It seems like <clears throat> Italian horror would uh, be best experienced... In a theater, for sure, yeah. Like has more impact, I think, yeah. Like that, you know. Like very loud, <laughs> yeah. On a big screen, in a dirty theater, very dirty, smoky, yeah. A few rats running around the seats, unclean. Some people getting, some people doing things, yeah. The other seats, yeah. Cool, cool. <laughs> no rules. Not cool. <laughs> <laughs> Grimy. <laughs> 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 yeah, I kind of crime, <laughs> crime, crime, and slime. <laughs> Lots of slime, <laughs> a little crime, <laughs> a little sleaze on top too. <laughs> so yeah, like I really got into Lucio Fulci. Do you know Lucio Fulci? I don't. He made the like unofficial sequel to Dawn of the Dead. It's called Zombie 2. Oh, time. you're missing that thing, yeah. Um, it's the movie where a zombie like fights a shark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, he made some 
pretty cool movies like C City of the Living Dead, uh, The New York Ripper, which is probably the most disturbing movie I've ever seen in terms really? of violence. Wow. Some, it's a notoriously nasty movie. When did it come out? 70s, I think. Really? Yeah, 70s or 80s, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was always off and on with Argento. But, you know, recently I thought, check out his other movies. Tenebrae was probably the best one I saw. Opera has maybe the best poster of all his movies. It's like a picture of a woman's face. And the key point of the movie is the killer tapes, like pins, under the eyelids of this woman he's stalking. And then he forces her to watch him murder people with these like pins so she can't close her eyes or they like cut her eyes some really like striking scenes there's one scene in a uh, how do you say like the opera costume department when there are these like gas cabinets around the room with mannequins and he like puts her in the cabinet like a mannequin and he puts like these pins under her eyes and forces her to watch this murder Jeez. um and then I watched, yeah, Deep Red. <clears throat> Interestingly, Deep Red is known as Suspiria 2, only in Japan. What's with Japan, like, changing titles of movies? It seems to have no connection to the original movie, like, at all, except it was made by Dario Argento. <laughs> I think Japan just, like, makes their own rules for movie names. Yeah. Like, uh... Famous example. The Fast and the Furious is called Wild Speed. Right. Yeah. Um, another example. Napoleon Dynamite. Do you know the Japanese name? I don't, yeah. I'd like to know. I'm pretty sure I, I know this. I think it's called uh, Encha Otoko. Otoko. Encha Otoko. <laughs> Bus man. <laughs> Train man. Train man. <laughs> pretty sure that's what it's called. Like something like really like... Straight yeah. to the point. <laughs> like, Jap like Western to Japanese like movie release, mm. like translated titles are often very like straight to the point. Mm, kind of on the nose, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I watched uh, the new Guy Ritchie movie recently, Jason Statham, and it's like I forget the original name, but it's about like uh, people who steal money from collect money from banks. It's just called like cash box or something <laughs> like very to the point yeah. yeah we looked it up it's called bus otoko napoleon dynamite yes uh, bus, bus man. otoko bus man bus man <laughs> <laughs> a new superhero for marvel to yeah make a franchise out yeah. of a billion dollars bus man I mean, yeah there are like tons of examples of that they just in real life it just lot, makes lot of everything real life it makes everything just more difficult my wife and I were like on this site looking at like it's like a movie catalog and you're like you go through like each movie and you like check if you've seen it or if you've never seen it and all the movie titles were in English and my wife she wasn't sure about a lot of them because the Japanese titles are different and when she saw the, the English titles she wasn't sure if it was the same movie or not because it can be like a completely different title yeah right so yeah anyway so yeah deep red suspiria 2 not really <laughs> <laughs> right. it was like okay so the movie follows um a pianist and one day he's just walking out around uh a city in italy i think it's rome i'm not sure and he sees a murder in a window Particularly brutal murder. The woman's like a psychic. We're like introduced to her at the start of the movie. The killer like slashes her in the back and then like she's in front of a window. He smashes her through a window, like, slashes her head again and she like falls neck first onto all the glass sticking up. Of course. Sprays everywhere. Of yeah. course. And the pianist is in the street and he sees this happen in the window and he does like everyone would do he runs to the apartment to rescue her I was gonna 
I thought you were going to say he grabs his cell phone and records it and puts it on live leak. <laughs> <laughs> he just puts it straight on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's seemingly not afraid of this serial killer at all. He just runs up there. Like, he's not saving the woman, right? She's obviously already dead at this point. Um, when he gets there, the killer's gone and he's just like walking away uh, in the street. And then the police come, he calls the police, and he meets this journalist. She's like a very quirky journalist. She's in Argento's other movies, this actress. And then they like start investigating this killer, trying to find this killer. It kind of gets a bit in the weeds, the story is a bit too complex. So I kind of lost interest halfway through. But I'm on like diehard Argento fans, they I kind of consider this his, like, masterpiece yeah. movie. Supposedly it influenced some of the bigger American directors. Mm. When was it released? Uh, it was released in 1975. It has a pretty good poster tagline. So the tagline goes, as a lot of movies in the 70s and 80s, they kind of, like, reference other movies and, like, we're out doing this movie. So the title, the tagline goes, Psycho, The Exorcist, Jaws. Now there's Deep Red. <laughs> and then under Deep Red, you will never forget it. <laughs> Damn. But to be honest, compared to those other movies, Resident kind of forgot it a little bit. Really? It's yeah. forgettable? <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. you, you got to be pretty confident to You're in some uh, high... invoke The Exorcist. You're in some high company there. Jaws, yeah. Psycho, and The Exorcist, right? Yeah, honestly, all three of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your balls have to be, like, this big. <laughs> yeah, of all the Giallo movies I watched recently, definitely Black Sabbath was the best one. Uh, that movie is an anthology, so it has three short stories um, all of them are really tense really well shot and the last one which was my favorite uh, a woman is called to an apartment late at night uh, the woman's uh, the apartment owner's mother has passed away and her body you see her body it's got this really scary like grimace a bit like reagan in the exorcist kind of Similar she's she's like, that. can't handle that. <laughs> it's like the one horror movie that oh, still gives me can't, trouble. Can't deal with, yeah. yeah. What I really liked about that one was the apartment. It's it's very it's very unique apartment. It has very high ceilings. It has like night armory like on display. Hmm. It's shot in like this purple light. There's like trash on the floor around and it really reminded me of the apartment in Blade Runner where the, the designer is living with the puppets walking around oh that guy okay, okay. yeah like his apartment is very atmospheric it's like a very strange atmosphere it's and, a pretty big apartment too yeah like that like, a like kind Deckard's of, apartment fucking like painter <laughs> His apartment's like a carnivorous kind of yeah. apartment. It really reminded me of that. So I don't know if Ridley Scott was influenced by uh, Black Sabbath, but I know some big directors have also been influenced by that mm. by that movie. So definitely worth checking out. Blade Runner was like, what, 1980, 1981, 1982? Yep. Mm. Around 18, 1980. Mm -hmm. Alex, do you like Alien? Alien? The movie Alien. Uh, yeah, actually, I watched it this week. Do you like Aliens? I do. In do fact, you... I might like Aliens a little more than Alien. Well, there are a lot of people in that group. Yeah. Yeah. Do you like The Fly? I love The Fly. Do you like The Thing? Yeah. Not as much as The Fly, but... Do you like Jaws? Uh, Jaws is... I mean, I appreciate it. I don't find myself wanting to watch it a lot. <laughs> Can you imagine if you combined all of those movies into one movie? <laughs> uh, Would you want to watch that movie? Yeah, that sounds amazing. And the main characters played by Robocop, Peter Weller. Okay. 
And it has Ernie Hudson, the dude from <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> okay. This is a real movie. Where do I send my money? <laughs> <laughs> this movie, Leviathan. That's the name of the movie. Leviathan. Leviathan, okay. From 1989. Directed by George Cosmatos. The director of Rambo and Tombstone. Really? Okay. Really. So yeah, I checked this movie out. I never heard of it before. I think I just typed in Google search, Google search like uh, 80s movie like The Fly or something. Just looking for something to watch. And this popped up. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this movie is about deep sea miners. Kind of like an abyss kind of vibe. If you know that like James Cameron movie. Yeah. And they kind of come across like a failed Russian experiment, like a biological experiment. And they bring sort of been like USSR era. Kind of, yeah, yeah, like Soviet yeah. era, I guess. And they bring in this like alien sea life creature thing into the ship. And one of the women finds it one of the female crew members and like in aliens i think it's in aliens like they the men in the crew like constantly make like sexist jokes about the other women you know what i mean they like when they're changing or something like oh uh, like <laughs> typical like yeah like sailor mm. dog kind of remind me in event horizon you know you like event horizon right yeah. when when they wake up it's like the uh, black dude says you want something black and hard in you or something? He's like, uh, like coffee or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> so there's like a dude on the crew like that. And there's like a shot where the woman's like, she's like fixing something and her breasts are like really in front of the camera and he makes like a boob joke or something. And so they kind of take revenge and they, the woman takes this like mutant thing and puts it in his bunk. <laughs> and he gets like bitten by it. I mean, he goes to the doctor. The, I guess they have just like a doctor on the crew. And he's got like a computer in Aliens and the thing. So in the thing, he puts like the equation into the computer. Like how long would it take to kill the world or mm, something like yeah. that. It does like mathematical equations. Yeah. He's got like, that kind of computer. Yeah. And this creature like slowly becomes like a virus. He starts getting like these lesions on his body. And then he like melds with another member of the crew. This is very body horror. <laughs> <laughs> it is body horror, but it's also like sea adventure. You know, those kind of 80s like undersea adventure movies. But it has like body 80s horror. 80s undersea adventure movies. Like Abyss or like not even, not even undersea, just like deep space, like Cocoon or that kind of thing. You okay. Know, like that kind of very 80s like. Yeah the unknown kind of movie and yeah it gets like progressively more silly really strange movie like it didn't seem to know whether it wanted to be like a serious like body horror Cronenberg Carpenter horror or like an adventure movie there's lots of like very dramatic like Hollywood music and honestly like a cross between and... the two sounds pretty interesting <laughs> <laughs> sounds pretty entertaining where can I watch this movie <laughs> <laughs> You gotta watch it right away when you get home. Okay. You are. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> I think I know what that means. YouTube. Okay. YouTube. Gotcha. You watch it on YouTube. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> the references, there are so many, it's like you can make a list. Like I actually made a list of the references. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got like the the thing, like body horror, bodies melding together. You had uh, the th I mentioned the fly so the actual final monster kind of looks like the fly a little bit computers the actual underground ship kind of looks like the ship from Alien like a like crappy version of it that's exactly what I imagined too <laughs> like as you described the story to me they all wear like like tank tops like yeah. the people in Alien yeah, yeah, yeah Peter Weller seems to be asleep for most of the movie. It's like a very like, laid-back performance. <laughs> like eyes half open, kind of. 
something like that. There's like a scene where Ernie Hudson is like holding like a door, like one of those automatic doors, like in Aliens. You've got it's kind of closed like that. You've got like a time limit. Mm -hmm. They've like jarred it open. The ship's like sinking. He's got like 13 seconds to get to the door, and he's like, ah, oh, try and get this chainsaw thing. <laughs> <laughs> Ernie Hudson's like. Fuck! <laughs> Hurry up! <laughs> Very strange performance by Peter Weller. Yeah. Was this in theaters or like was it like a straight to video? I have no kind of idea. Thing? I have no idea. I don't think it's a straight to video movie because it didn't seem that low budget. Not low budget enough to be a straight to video movie. It had a couple of recognizable actors in it. On the poster, it directly says the movie it's copying because it says in the tagline. <laughs> 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 a bit like the. The Suspiria 2, yeah. Deep Red, it says, Aliens thrilled you, the fly shocked you, now experience real fear. Did you experience real yeah. fear? I did not. No. <laughs> did you experience uh, an exciting time? I thought I just wish I was watching Aliens right now, to be honest. Jeez. While I was watching it. So. Really? Yeah. But it did have some really hilarious moments near the end. Uh, I guess you probably don't remember the end song from Jaws, the final credits. There's the like end a, song? Like when the credits stop coming down, there's like a like a happy melody. Wow. You got a mic in front of you. Like that. Okay. It doesn't ring a bell. It has a very similar melody, the end of this movie. It's like an almost identical <laughs> melody to the Jaws, and then it, and then it goes into like a very like total recall, like bum ba bum ba 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 bum, eighties like <laughs> kind of sound. Would you recommend this movie? <laughs> Would you recommend this movie for someone looking for like a like a cheesy B movie esque thing? Sure, to watch. Yeah. Yeah, in that case, I might check it out. I'm really into like 80s, like body horror, cheesy action movies. Not usually together, but the fact this had body horror and cheesy action mm -hmm. movie like made me want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like like sea horror movies, like shark movies mm -hmm. or under the sea horror movies. Or I also like space horror, and I think they're kind of similar. Like if you're at the bottom of the ocean. Or deep in space, it's kind of the same thing. Right? Yeah, it's, like you it's can't surrounded by the unknown. You can't escape. You can't get out of the ship yeah. without, you know, in space you're gonna die, and in the sea you're gonna die. You know? Yeah. Um, and there's kind of another Jaws reference. So, in Jaws, like he shouts, like what does he shout when he shoots the tank? Yeah, Peter Weller shoots, like say hi, motherfucker, and then he like basketball throws. <laughs> A grenade <laughs> <laughs> into the thing's mouth. That ass. It's very 80s and 90s. Like, proper like swish like that throw. I don't think that would... Bizarre throw. That would never exist in a movie made after the year 2000. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's very much of its time. 